So this is part of a series of talks run by the Students' Union. So the Students' Union calls itself Sue Arts. I hope you guys have seen that around. I did have it up there. Um, and we also have a project called Made in Arts London. And Made in Arts London sells and promotes work by UAL students, so it's quite unique. Um, we've received money from the Arts Council to put on an exhibition and have a series of talks accompanying the exhibition. Um, this is one of them. And it's called Documenting Your Work. And the reason being, um, we have been asked by various students for help with documentation. Um, we've referred students to the ArtQuest website, which we, which Nick Nicholas Caploni has has actually done up a sheet of information specifically for you guys who've come here tonight. Um, and uh, I know a few people who were able to recommend names to me um, of good speakers. So it all kind of came together. Um, it's actually quite nice. Um, let's take advantage of the fact that there's so few of you here, in a way, um, because you can uh, interject a little bit. You know, I don't think it, we can be, we should be as formal as if we had a big lecture theatre. Um, are, are you guys okay to be? Yeah, yeah. I think that's well right. I think if we keep it as yeah, <laughs> as discussion based as possible, then, um, so that we can have uh, our presentations, and then as each as you think of questions, maybe ask and don't interrupt too much. Obviously, um, I, I'm sure you're all very polite people. So um, I'm going to uh, introduce everybody to start off with instead of, uh, as I say, interrupting. So we have um, Louise O'Kelly, who is going to speak first. And Louise is an independent curator and arts professional um, based in London. She is currently our forums rep for the UK and Ireland and director of Block Universe, um, which you'll hear about. And it's a new performance festival for London and it's launching in June. So Louise is really, really busy and it's supported by Arts Council England as well and in partnership with Kitchen New York. Um, we have uh, Tina, who's going to speak after Alex. Um, Tina went to Gwent College, which was really nice to see on your bio, that, you know, somewhere a little bit regional represented, but then went to Goldsmith, so that's a nice contrast. Um, and is director of No Show Space, which was set up in 2012, and it's an independent platform to exhibit and publish innovative contemporary art projects. Um, no, Show, no Show Space offers practical support for artists to explore and take risks in their working practice, actively encouraging innovation and engagement with new technologies and new models of distribution. Um, we have Alex, who I mentioned briefly, Alex Eisenberg, who's from uh, the Live Art Development Agency, or LADA. And um, Alex works with performance video and web, and he's digital manager at the Live Art Development Agency, where he produces digital projects and initiatives. Um, and Nicola is Nicola Conaberry, is a London based choreographer whose work explores the role of the body in performance and with particular interest in how the exchange between performers and audience can be acknowledged through the live event and how notions of theatricality, fictionality, and spectacle function within that project. Am I speaking too fast? So, okay. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. Um, and we do have Dan, and I do have information on Dan. Um, so Dan was recommended to me by uh, Lawrence, who's from Open School East, and if you don't know about Open School East, please do look it up. Really, really interesting new model, if we're going to talk about new models in general for education. And um, Dan is an artist and photographer from London, and um, studied fine art and painting at Wimbledon, big up Wimbledon, and um, documentary photography and photojournalism at London College of Communication. And he has been photographing for the last five years for galleries. Regular clients include Whitechapel, ICA, and Foundling, which is a nice little hidden treasure in London as well. Um, have I introduced everybody? Okay. Um, can I ask Louise to talk and yeah. to give me the nod when you want? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm Louise O'Kelly. I'm going to stand a bit with my back to you just it's because that projector light is slightly blinding. Yeah, so as mentioned, I'm director of Block Universe, which is a new annual performance art festival for London, uh, taking place this 8th to the 14th of June. So please do come along and support us. Um, the theme for the first year of this festival is uh, about legacies of performance. So we're looking at really how we can sustain an engagement with performance and how we can keep it alive, particularly as a festival, but also um, in general looking at that idea. So um, this is obviously particularly relevant when we're talking about an art form which is considered fleeting or ephemeral. Um, and I'm going to do a little uh, whistle-stop tour, I think, through a short history of uh, different positions regarding documentation of performance, 
and uh, its implications starting with the 70s. And it'll be some very familiar examples which will kind of feed back into uh, what we're looking at in terms of block universe in the program. So, um, Claire? <laughs> Um, first, we're going to look at Hannah Wilkie, who is a well-known performance artist coming from a feminist perspective. Um, and she's obviously very uh, conscious of the male gaze in her work, how um, she's represented in the image and, uh, and her use of the body in performance. So uh, she also famously coined the term performless self-portraits, which were about these per um, performances directly to camera that she did. So uh, I thought this work would be particularly relevant um, when we're talking about um, negotiating how we document performance. So Super Tart was originally a performance performed at the kitchen in New York as part of an evening performance. And there is a, a film of the performance where we can see um, that it was essentially a, a series of freezes which almost started as a striptease and ended up in this sort of Christ type pose that you see here. Um, and so in the film you can obviously see uh, the duration of the piece, the audience's reaction, and um, the whole process. So interestingly, um, Hannah Wilkie, after the performance, decided to re-perform this directly to camera. So uh, she commissioned a photographer to document each of the freezes where she had paused. And I think in this way she really takes back authorship of the work and its representation in the world. Um, and she, in, in that sense, I think she um, is also very <laughs> conscious of the circulation of the image. So she's kind of taking back sort of her intention for the work and very clearly illustrating um, the process by which she went through. So I think this is sort of interesting when we're talking about circulation of imagery and its life beyond performance, um, which I think for Hannah Wilkie as well, was also maybe contrary to many positions surrounding performance at the time, which was supposed to be sort of anti-commodification of the art object in a sense, which is something she also plays with the, her, her body as object. Um, and then we'll go on to uh, looking at um, Carly Schiemann, Interior Scroll, which I think is uh, a very well, I, I don't know this thing on the side, we can <laughs> probably lose that if possible, but, um, but oh, you can that here. Um, so, I mean, this is obviously one of those iconic images of performance, and I think um, it's important uh, to note how this performance, with, you know, maybe 20 to 30 people saw it, but the number of people that have seen this image, um, it obviously had a huge life beyond this performance. It's become, you know, very definitive in terms of what we think when we think of Carly Schneeman and also when we think of body art performance at that time. Um, so I think it's important to reference how uh, you know, the image gains currency in a sense. Um, yeah, I mean, in some ways I kind of almost think about this as, if you think about the Mona Lisa image or something, sort of how that um, can, you know, like really, I mean, <laughs> can, uh, you know, can, can become iconic in a way. Um, so then moving on to uh, work of Anna Mendieta, I think this is another interesting point in terms of that relationship of performance with uh, photography and the image. So Anna Mendieta, I mean, she has a very interesting practice which crossed over between body art and land art. And, um, and I think, well, when she was uh, studying at Iowa, Univer Iowa University, she was under the tutelage of Hans Breeder, who had this very specific um, three-part methodology, which was about concept, execution, and documentation. So she really adopted this approach, and it became very integral in um, her art making. And although Anna Mendieta also did do a, a lot of performance to public and to audiences, um, she also increasingly worked in a solitary fashion in the landscape. So, I mean, this is one example of where she would use her body and, and the elements that were available to produce work, where there may have just been one other person there to document her work. So, I think this kind of takes it a, a further step away from documenting live performance to um, where the image is actually the intended final product. And I mean, this is kind of also an interesting point in a very practical sense for anyone working with performance to think about. Um, I mean, for example, I know someone like Marina Abramovich, when she works with her gallery, they have, you know, they select images which represent particular performances and that becomes an addition which is sold, which is a means of sustaining her financially. So, um, 
interestingly, I think um, the fact that uh, Anna Mendieta worked so um, strongly with documentation and created a very clear um, archive of her work, in a sense, um, led to some interesting developments where in the 90s there was um, a young performance artist called Tanya Bruguera who decided to re-perform Mendieta's works from the images that she had. So, uh, I mean, this kind of obviously raised a lot of complications in terms of the family estate and <coughs> copyright and ownership of those, but I think the important distinction was that um, Rivera really wanted to focus on her embodied experience of performing those actions, and so no documentation exists of Tanya Bruguera's re-performances of these, um, but, you know, I think it's kind of an interesting conversation in terms of um, the memory of performance and how we experience it directly the live. Uh, which will bring me on to our next slide, which is um, another very well-known performance artist, uh, Marina Abramovich. And uh, this is an image of her work, 70s pieces at the Guggenheim, uh, where she re-performed or reenacted or interpreted um, seminal uh, performances from history, such as Valley Export, as we see her on the right, or Joseph Boyce. Um, but of course she did this in her own particular fashion, very Marina Bromwich way, which was a durational work, so um, she performed this for all of the hours that the museum was open. And I think this kind of takes it another level away again, where uh, the image that she's actually working with, the Valley Exports, uh, Jenny Panic, is not actually even uh, an image of the performance itself, which is where she purportedly stopped the aisles of her local cinema confronting men with the reality of women as opposed to their representation on the screen. Um, so, I mean, this, you know, is kind of, I guess, represents that action itself, but this is what Marina Bromwich chose to reinterpret. And I think uh, that kind of, I mean, you know, it's been written that she was, uh, you know, been accused of doing paint by numbers rather than a faithful uh, rendition of original performances. So. Um, I think that conversation about you know how performance lives on, whether it's through reperformance and or whether it's a reenactment or it's an interpretation of um, uh, you know how we do that, whether it's using you know documentation of something at the time, is it using a score, and really you know how valid is this as a means of um, keeping performance alive in a way and sustaining engagement with it. So. Um, this is something that I have found particularly interesting and uh, you know, it's looking at the idea of the body as archive. Um, and this is something that there's a dance scholar called Andre Lepecki who has written about this idea. If we go into our next slide, we'll see uh, an image of an artist called Julie Tolentino, who is um, working with Ron Athey, who's another very well-known performance art that I think um, Lada have done a lot of work with. Um, so, in this piece, uh, Julia Tolentino offers her body up as an archive for performance art. So in this work, um, Ron Athey does his performance, Julie Tolentino witnesses it, and then he starts again, repeats it while she mirrors his actions. And then in the final round, she is essentially sedimenting the choreography into her body and performs it again solo. Um, and I think this concept is really, really interesting that she's working with about how the body becomes the repository for information and, and how we access that information through performance again. Um, so this is, I mean, this is really what's informing, I guess, uh, the theme of the first year of Block Universe, where um, if we go on to the next slide, we'll see um, images of some of the artists that we're working with. So. Um, Really, we're looking at different forms of performance which are designed to be repeated in a way, or where the elements of choreography or rehearsal, um, you know, even song, oral histories, or storytelling, and uh, types of performance that embody documents um, exist. So this is um, really kind of what we're looking at in terms of the festival and the program. So. There are a lot of artists such as Nicola who work with dance, um, there are artists who work with uh, narrative memory pieces, uh, they use song or storytelling in their works, um, and really it's, it's us looking at an alternate mode of um, keeping performance alive in a way. So, I mean, in conclusion really, it's, um, 
you know, the, the idea lock universe in itself is, um, it's actually a physics theory which describes an alternate theory of time where past, present, and future exist simultaneously. So this idea about circularity of time and um, performance always being available and ever present in the body, ready to be activated, is central to the theme that we're working with. Um, and we just go to the last slide, I'll give you a full list of artists, which I very much hope you'll come and see. Um, we'll be in several locations across central London, so please do check the website, which is blockuniverse.co.uk. Um, we'll be uploading the program uh, to come. And I suppose the short note is really that, although in this program we are prioritizing these modes of performance that um, place the body at the center of uh, that archival story in a way, um, it's important to note that on a very practical level, we will of course be documenting everything as fully as we can through photography and film. And I'm sure many of my uh, co-speakers have a lot to comment on that, so I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Just to say, uh, as ever, I always forget things. Well, we, the idea was... <laughs> There's a lot of chairs in the room, so don't worry about it. Um, one thing I did say was the, apart from like keep it informal and ask questions and mm -hmm. drop in whenever you like, um, <laughs> that uh, the idea is just to have some contextual information first. So Louise and Alex are sitting over there in the contextual corner, <laughs> and then uh, this is the contextual corner. Contextual corner. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is this is practical alley down here, yeah. and these guys are just. <laughs> um, but. The fact that um, Nicola is actually an artist and Dan does a lot of documentation and Tina knows what she needs from her artists and what she needs to help them with as well, so that's why. Um, so Alex, again, with the contextual information. Can I be really, really random and just say, I completely forgot to say that Commonplace, UAL Commonplace, funded this talk as well. What? <laughs> um, so Alex, if you want to uh, okay. move on to your presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Alex Eisenberg. I work... Um, oh, yeah, do you want to put on my presentation? Okay, just while she's doing that, um, uh, okay. um, I've just got two slides, this is the first one and there's one at the end, so you can just look at that quickly and then you can look at me. Um, I just want to get a sense of kind of um, who's actually in the room, who kind of works with performance or live work in some way. One person, two person, three person. Any, do, do, does anyone else have any relationship to, to, to live work or any ambition to work with live work? Teachers have said that I should, but I just right. don't know how to get it. I've seen online, but I'm just about to graduate, so I'm just sure. pulled in so many different directions. But I think there's some online where they call out for collaboration. Yeah. So it's just making the first little steps. First steps. Okay. Well, hopefully I can give some ideas towards thinking about the documentation of performance. But in terms of making performance, that's, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> um, so yeah, I work at the Live Art Development Agency. Actually, who's, who's heard of the Live Art Development Agency? You have, you've heard of everything. <laughs> and you guys too, yeah. So for those of you that haven't heard about it, also a bit for those of you that have, um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the agency and about my, my work there. So um, a big part of what we do comprises of digital projects and initiatives, and my work is kind of all about stewarding and kind of managing and thinking through those sorts of things. We're a small little team, we're five people, so in the end we all kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, and I also have my own practice as an artist, and a part of that is to make a performance, but I'm also quite concerned and have been for a, for a while with thinking about documentation in relation to performance, and particularly how that can be a kind of artistic practice in and of itself. Um, so, a little bit about the Live Art Development Agency. Um, we began in 1999, um, and uh, we're, we kind of exist to support and develop live art practices and performance practices in the UK. And we also work internationally as well. And we do that through sort of four main ways. We, we run projects, we provide opportunities to artists. Right now we've just got our annual DIY. Hello. No, come on in. Um, right now we've got our annual DIY program, which is a series of professional development opportunities run by artists for other artists. Um, we um, publish books, we're a publisher, we work in lots of different co-publications as well, and then we offer all sorts of resources to artists as well. One of the key resources that some of you that know the agency might know is the study room, 
um, which I'm going to be talking a little bit more about in a second. Um, and now, Lada's work is, is, tends to be about supporting particularly challenging artists. Artists that perhaps feel they don't have a home elsewhere for various reasons, whether that's because of their politics, because of their identity, or because of their background in various ways. And I think part of what we do is we try and provide context for um, challenging and uh, difficult work in various ways. I'm based in Hackney, Wake, East London, which is quite far from here. Um, but um, we're always open for visits, and, and you can come in and use the study room, and uh, lots and lots of people do that the whole time. So I wanted to just uh, outline a few of the ways in which Lada uh, kind of relates to documentation. And it's kind of quite a multifaceted relationship. Um, we are a generator of documentation, so we make, we produce quite a lot of documentation. We're, we're a repository for documentation, so we hold lots of documentation. We, we kind of take it in into our into our sort of grasp in various ways, and we try and look after it. We try and keep it safe, um, and we try and contextualise it well. And we partly do that through platforming documentation. We feature and showcase and share documentation in a whole series of different ways. So, um, yeah, so in terms of being a generator, obviously, like, we're, we're running all sorts of projects. They range from talks, discussions, uh, research, uh, more kind of visible performance programs, and that generates a whole lot of documentation that we store in our study room and is available to, to view also online. We also uh, do a lot of thinking about how to kind of develop practices of documentation. So we do that through discussion. We do that through research projects. We've just recently completed a research project with uh, University of Chichester, which has kind of looked at, it's called Documenting Intimacy, and it's about the relationship between documentation and one-on-one -on -one performance. So performance where there's just one performer and one person receiving the performance, how do you, how do you document that? Um, so that's resulted in the website. And just to say, like, there's a whole load of links and stuff that are included in my presentation, which I'm going to be able to uh, give the link for at the end. As a repository, um, the kind of most obvious way we're a repository is through the study room. Um, and the study room began as one little shelf in the corner of the office in 1999, and it's grown to be about 6,500 items. It's essentially a library. It's also a collection of lots and lots of documentation. Probably out of, out of around 6,500 items, we have probably about 2,000 items, which can be thought of as documentation in one way or another. Um, and it's, it's archival, we've got a really kind of extraordinary archive of about 850 VHS tapes um, from primarily but not exclusively of performances from the ICA from the 80s and 90s. And we're in the process of digitising that at the moment. So there's lots and lots of stuff, there's digital files, there's reams of DVDs, there's, there's, and that ranges from kind of much more archival record based documentation to more crafted films and various other things. Um, in terms of platforming documentation, um, right now we're just about to we're just putting the final touches to a kind of new uh, kind of digital channel that we have called Live Online, which is actually a series of about I think seven kind of thematically curated video channels which you are able to access online, and that features videos and films and other kind of uh, digital material from our collections. Um, so please look out for the launch of that, and please um, have, have a browse through. There's lots of great stuff there. Um, and then we also feature documentation through, uh, well this is another new project which is happening uh, alongside Live Online, it's called Lava Screens. And that's going to be more like a kind of online screening space, a bit like a cinema, it'll be kind of there for like a short duration, there'll be a film. A lot of the films that we've selected and artists we've selected for that are, are using <coughs> documentation. Um, so we're hoping to feature and provide context uh, around that. So, so look out for Lava Screens. One of the kind of baseline ways that we interact with documentation is through publishing. We publish books, we publish DVDs, we make films, we do digital projects. And artists can profile and include their documentation in that. And we kind of do that at a range of different levels, from like a very DIY type of publication. We've just done a, like basically like a zine-style publication about live art feminism, to much more kind of grander, bigger budget projects, like we produced the book about De Ching Che, the uh, Taiwanese-American-based uh, artist, 
uh, with, which was a book produced in collaboration with MIT Press and Adrian Heathfield, and it's like a big, heavy thing. So we, we, we kind of operate across a whole range of different, um, different scales there. And lastly, another way, another space that documentation gets featured is through our online store. So we sell books, artist books, books about performance and, and documentation figures in that in quite a big way. And that's called Unbound. So please check it out. Lots and lots of good stuff on that. So I wanted to just think for a moment about what's, what's changed. And it's been great to have a real like, <laughs> longer history. I mean, there's so much to say about the history of documentation and performance. And you can kind of, I was, the obvious point is to go back to the 60s and 70s, but you can kind of go back to the beginning of the century, really, yeah. to, to when recording media started. But I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to take the last 15 years, which is, the, which is the, how old the agency is. Um, and just draw out some of the some of the, the changes in the last 15 years. And you alluded to this first one, which is um, performance can be recorded. I think there was an idea, um, and there still is for some people, but that, that, that performance can only exist if you're there, and you just shouldn't record. You shouldn't even bother. And I kind of agree with that. I think that it is it is an event that happens in a particular time. But what's kind of interesting to uh, kind of see as a change is that documentation is not trying to emulate necessarily the live event, but is in fact trying to be something other, something else. And I think for me, um, embracing that idea that we can't capture this moment here, even if we're on a camera back there, <laughs> but that recording is something other than this event. And if you kind of think through in that way, I think it opens up a whole lot of possibilities for what documentation <coughs> can be. Secondly, um, and the second thing that's changed is, is writing, writing from live art. Um, one of the ways that I first started thinking and interacting with documentation around performance and live art was actually through writing. Um, the agency did a project in about, I think it was 2006 or 2007, where writers were invited to come and think about not how they could write about live art or performances, but how they could kind of write from the live moment in a way. So they were kind of in a more intimate dialogue with the live event. And then um, off the back of that, I was involved in a project in 2007 called Spill Over Spill, which was a kind of writer's program kind of embedded within the Spill Festival and was a way to think about writing as a kind of form of documentation. Um, and I think that's been a big change in, in, in the last 15 years. There's many people now doing that type, type of thing. The third point are this, the absolutely huge advances in, in technology, in digital technology over the last 15 years. We all have phones in our pockets, and not just phones, those phones are HD video cameras, they are fantastic audio recorders, they're editors. You know, that is a huge kind of seismic shift in the, the relationship of like what I'm calling the documentation <laughs> machine, you know, in relation to being able to make documents. It's just wholly more available. And 15 years ago, there was just a whole different relationship to that. Fourthly, um, there are platforms for sharing in ways that there haven't been. Social media is the, in, uh, since the last few years. So, so social media is the, is the kind of obvious one. You can share uh, stuff very quickly in a really temporal way. And you do see artists kind of using that partly for marketing purposes, but I think there are also some interesting examples of people kind of using those spaces, intervening with those spaces in kind of critical ways as well. And obviously blogs and online press and various magazines, but these platforms, having the availability of these platforms has really kind of reconfigured um, how we need to think about our documentation because it kind of really matters what you put out there. The last point about what's changed is, is, is who can make documentation. Um, and there's sort of two ways that I was thinking about this. One is that artists can do documentation themselves. You can have access, cheap, quick access to the tools for documentation. But another way of thinking about this as well is that, is that as technology has kind of um, democratized things, people that were not able to represent themselves or to uh, make themselves appear in the past are now able to do that in ways that are much, much easier than they were 15 years ago. So I think that's been a significant shift. So um, I also now wanted to think about now. I wanted to think about what 
what can we actually do as, as makers, as practitioners, as, in terms of our practice. And I, I just wanted to kind of offer a few approaches to documentation that have partly come from my own experience, testing things, trying things, and making probably a lot of mistakes, but also they've come from things that we see, um, see at the agency. And I've got five points here. So the first point is to make choices. Even in the, the simplest act of setting up a camera at the back of the room and recording this presentation, there are a whole series of choices that need to be made. Where do you put the camera? Is it zoomed in? Is it taking this in? What's the sound like? And all of these can actually be seen as creative choices, I think, and really can affect the, uh, the dynamics or the output in the end. So I just urge you to like, think about those choices, even if you think it's so simple. There's, there's a whole set of considerations. And that's kind of approaching what I would call a kind of critical documentation. So documentation that is in some way critically engaged with itself and with its kind of wider frame. The second point is to make documentation integral. How can you bring documentation into a process from the beginning? So it's not just an afterthought. I think there's a tendency if you're making live work, and this is completely understandable, to spend a lot of time on the live event itself. But increasingly, I think we're seeing artists who recognize the importance of their documentation, conceiving of and working on uh, strategies for documentation and methods for documentation from the beginning of their process. So they are uh, sort of um, changing the parity between documentation and the live event. My third point is make resources available. Documentation, like anything, requires resources. It may require money. If you have a budget to work on something, you may need to actually specifically budget for documentation equipment, even though like, that's free sometimes. If you need to get like, more expensive equipment, that can cost money. So you know, um, budgeting for it, thinking about how you can properly resource it is, is really important. If you don't have money, you can still think about how you, how you can resource it. That can be to do with how much time you give it. Do you, do you kind of like, allow enough time to be able to conceive of and make your documentation? Fourthly, versions. Thinking about documentation um, as a process of kind of versioning has been a really useful way for me in terms of uh, opening up its possibilities. So, like, I really see like, carefully crafted documents as just another version of the live work. And again, this is back to the idea that it's kind of something other, it's something different, but um, I've just been really drawn to the, to the notion of, of, of versions because I think it kind of keeps um, a conversation or a dialogue that might have started in a live work kind of going in some way. And then lastly, it's about making collaborations. Um, so much documentation requires working with other people. And there are a variety of different ways I think that you can do that. You know, I'm sure, David, a lot of time you come in at the last minute and you have to like photograph and, and like, I think that's one option. But if you can kind of craft relationships with the people that are documenting, if you can bring them into your process and actually think of that, think of that <coughs> as a collaboration, I think that can make for a He's had enough. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, documentation just got too much. Mm -hmm. um, but so I think working with other people is really, really important. And you know, if you really bring that, that other collaborator, even more than one collaborator, into a process, you can provide all sorts of alternative uh, kind of perspectives on your work, which I think can be really useful. There's lots more I can say, but I'm going to stop there. Um, so I've got a link, you can go to my second slide, if you watch, watch the gorilla. Eh. <laughs> very and much like Doug Fishbone's work. I don't know Doug Fishbone's work. He, so he made a giant installation of bananas. Uh, it's worth saying that this is an artist called George Chakravarti, he's a um, British Asian artist who, this is a performance where he kind of uh, is dressed as a gorilla originally and then he jet, like, kind of dances amazingly and it all comes off. He eventually does take the head off as well. But um, this is a link. This is Live Art UK, documenting hyphen your hyphen work. 
if you go to that link, you'll actually get access to all of my notes. I'm, I'm make those um, uh, available. And then underneath, I've actually uh, compiled probably about 20 or 30 links to other artists, to groups, to projects that I've been involved in, to photographers, to video makers, to uh, events and exhibitions, both things that are coming up and things that have existed in the past. Importantly, to publications. Uh, there's some really great publications which discuss these sorts of things in a lot more detail, most of which we sell on Unbound. And then I've also put in some links to some archives as well. Um, and if you want to talk to me at all about any of this stuff, you can get in touch. My details are on there too. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, thanks for putting them all on the site. That's really. Well, I had to do it anyway, so. That's oh, you yeah. <laughs>
as well as a kind of installation. I actually paid somebody to, to photograph it for me. And that was the first time I actually paid a photographer to install, um, not to install, to photograph the installation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but so, yeah, that was, that was, that was cleaning of, of the future, um, future of technologies in your hands, yeah. That's, mm -hmm. So, so I do, if I have a budget, I will, it's good to pay for somebody. And um, Daniel actually introduced me to a very good photographer called Peter White. I don't know if you've come across him before. But he, um, he was, he was, um, uh, he, he came with his lights and he had a kind of little colour badge reader and, and, he, and he, he was just wonderful because it, um, it, was, it was a very difficult um, show to, to photograph. I don't think, have we haven't seen Daniel's work so far. But yeah, so this is Daniel. And it was quite, it was quite, um, there were two things that we wanted from this from these photographs. One was Daniel wanted to record his own work, you know, he wanted photographs of, of his paintings so that he could use them for, you know, to show people that were interested in. And I actually needed more the, photo, the works as in, as an in installed show kind of thing. So there were kind of two, two sets of photographs. Um, but, um, the space is quite small, so it, it's, there's quite a bit of distortion. And with all these lines, it was quite, it was quite a lot of adjustment to, to the photographs to kind of, to kind of get to a square. But, but Peter was amazing, and he, in the end, he, he presented me with like 10 photographs. I think you're seeing pretty much all the photographs that he gave me. So I didn't have too much choice. I didn't have to edit anything. Because when you do it yourself, then the artist does it, and then somebody else does it, you can end up with just so many photographs that, that you'll kind of spend a lot of time kind of working through those photographs. So that's kind of partly why it's so nice working with a professional. Um, can I ask questions about the time? Yeah? Yeah. Um, I just wondered, like, when you said, like, oh, I think we're quite trained to think about documentation being so important. So, especially when introducing it to people we have never met or they have never seen the work in real life, or like you know, they never came across it. So I find it quite interesting when you said like, oh, it's not. I don't really expect those pictures, but then you do invest in it quite a lot. You know that you wanted to do it right because it's like an installation of you know, like maybe it's made for that specific space. Yeah. So I mean. Yeah, I wonder, like, how do you then know? I mean, because I, you know, we have all these dictatorships of like, oh, you are 60 slides, and like these kind of things. So, I mean, it does, it must influence you as well. Like, do you feel like you can, because you have a more, you know, you're not maybe in it for like, profit, you really sustain maybe a more personal relationship with the artist yeah. that ena it enables you not, not to have these, like, oh, thousands of slides that you have to watch and like, oh, no, no. Because you maybe can do a studio for it or something. I don't know if this is really a question. Yeah, so. No, no, it's yeah. a good point. Um, but I, yeah, I, I it's, 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 it's not more is better, it's definitely, it's just a few, a fewer slides of generally good, kind of considered slides um, or images. Yeah. Than to grasp. Um, but is your question more about the quality of. of or well, no, because you said I don't expect it, but I do feel, I think. A lot of us do feel like it's been expected from us, and I think you also in engage with it when you invite artists in your space yeah, yeah. to say like, listen, maybe I don't pay, but I give you this amazing documentation yeah. because it may the documentation does look amazing. But I think it's kind of going back to the mobile phone in a way. So many of the conversations I have with yeah. people are just like these kind of devices, and they are just kind of quick, instant images. Yeah. It's kind of what's happening, it's like work in progress, in practice, it's yeah. kind of, so it's not so much about, you know, a present, like what, what I have here is these are, uh, you know, these kind of went on to be published and yeah. I kind of sent them to kind of collectors and, and so they had a, a reason to be of this quality, yeah. this kind of, but actually communicating the idea that that can happen in a much lower quality kind of, 
much more immediate way of looking at that. So, that's that. Um, um, so in terms of the timing of, of documentation, I kind of, I try and, you know, the install happens, the opening, and then it literally, with that first weekend, I'll try and um, document the show. And that's literally so that I can send images out as, as, um, as quickly as I, you know, as possible. Because speed is, is kind of quite important as well, in that how, quick, how quick things go out there. So, and I, I, it hasn't happened to me, but there are spaces around me where I know that people will sell work. They'll send a set of photographs to a group of people and they'll make sales. And the, the buyer won't even go to the space. They'll actually buy from the photograph. So, that's how important kind of photographs can be. And I've heard also Insta Instagram is being is quite important in terms of documenting work and, and how quickly it kind of moves about. Because I, I think there's a, there can be a bit of a buzz, that's what the idea is when you have a show is that you know, people are interested and it kind of happens quite quickly if it's going to happen. But, but again, not always. So, so, um, so then, at, it's only at the end of the show that I'll put all the uh, the, the images online because that, at that point, that's when I that's when I want to show people what my what the show is. So that, um, for people that haven't actually come to the space, because you know, uh, I'm re I hope to reach an audience that's quite a bit, bit bigger than the, the people that managed to make it to the opening. And so I kind of build up an archive of content. And I kind of see documentation as content in a way because, um, you know, I, I have a website that I'm just adding to all the time. And the more the more content I'm able to, to, to put up, the more the more people will go to it, and, and the, the higher the audience you know, figures for it. And it's and it has a life that just keeps kind of going going on. We've done we had a talk with Daniel's um, Sturgis's um, show and. And it's kind of interesting because, you know, it was really well attended to talk, but probably there were probably about 40 people, so it's not, you know, it's not a lot of people. And then, and then you kind of publish the video, and then there's a certain audience. But then, the good thing is, once it's up there online, it, the, the audience kind of, the, the viewers just grow, you know, and it's a steady growth, and it's not related to, to when the show was. So it's a kind of so it's good to, to kind of publish online. Um, yeah, so I think, well, I've also brought some some publications, which are just like little booklets and exhibition pamphlets that kind of, that kind of accompany them. And, and, and they kind of came about through documentation. I didn't, the pink one was like the first, the first one that I kind of did, and it just literally, I'm working with artists that haven't really published anything before, yeah. And and it's really helpful for them. It's kind of promotional. You know, it is for sale, but I don't sell many. It's actually more. It's kind of useful to give to people, and you know, and for me to actually be to distribute in bookshops and in libraries. So there's that kind of record, and I, you know, there's something coming up in the Tate Turbine Hall of as a as a kind of artist print. Um, books and it, it's, it's just good publicity it's a good way to get out there into the world and it's quite cheap because it's not an art fair you know it's kind of publishing so it's um you reach people who are interested in print as well so obviously we're talking a lot about digital documentation and be the first to touch on print documentation mm -hmm. um, but i know somebody who did uh, something with the freud museum so they invited a lot of contemporary artists to do work with them and there was a pamphlet that she completely forgotten she didn't produce and Joseph Kasuth got his hands on it and invited her to a show in Vienna, where, along with like Baldassari and Holtz, Jenny Holzer and these amazing people. And it was through this pamphlet that she'd for, kind of forgotten she produced, really. Um, but just the value of both print yeah. and hands. Yeah. Um, because Kasuth is obviously a lot older and he's probably a bit more comfortable with with that. Yeah. Well, print is digital too as well, isn't it? That's the great thing about print. It used to be really expensive, but now it's actually cheap, you yeah. know, and, yeah. and there's less there's less of it. Like, there was a time when you get so much stuff, invitations through the post. Mm -hmm. Now now it's quite unusual to get it, so it's actually, people do notice a little bit. But, uh, yeah, and then, and then for my own 
well, for myself, I ended up documentation for, we, we had a new gallery sign, which was the, an artist's project as well. Sorry, this is such a tiny postcard, but yeah. it, was a, it was a great photo, and, it, but it, and I just turned it into a, a postcard, just as, it's just kind of promotional, and I just use it all the time. But it's it's the director of Tate Britain who unveiled this gallery sign, so it's kind of it's a really nice little promotional kind of thing. So and that's what you can get with you know it was a complete fluke photograph, and it, you know again it was just somebody it wasn't professional. It was just done on a you know big standard camera. But it is well, a strong image. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that that artist it's it's about the artist that actually you know taking the image more than the Oh yeah, yeah. So that's well. why you said like, <laughs> <laughs> like into the high quality. Yeah, yeah. But it is still about having a, you know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I want to see that. You know. Yeah. 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 I think I have, I have a feeling that it's going to be good. I've got a few questions for you, so maybe it might, would rather I'm about ten or anything. Mm -hmm. I'm asked for more seven days in, in, in between spaces. So I might actually move on quickly because so we have time for questions at the end. Yeah, brilliant. Um, is it okay with that actually Dan speaks now because uh, oh, sure. I just have I, I'm afraid of nothing's really on. working for me on it, so I'm I'm feeling <laughs> the videos are gonna be an issue, so hopefully we can figure that out at the end. Okay. So Dan, are you okay to give sure. two tips and advice now? Yeah, 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 sure. Um I've got this one yeah. that goes on. So um, I just like you just me moving. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, feel free to put it on auto and then um, I'll just talk around them, I think. Um, I'm the one that says talk. Uh, who does it say? Yeah. Hello, Dolomish. We haven't been very helpful for her. No, I haven't. No, I didn't either. I didn't think about putting my name on the file. But anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm a photographer and um, I document works for artists um, and I collaborate with artists and also provide photographs and documentation um, of events for, for galleries. Um, um, you'll need to open all, otherwise we'll just do a slideshow of one. We'll do it. Yeah. It's going for ten minutes. It's one inch. Just just select them all and then do the slideshow. Okay. Cool. Uh, you need to open them. Double uh, click. Can you tell them on digital? Okay. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Click on the file name. and also um, some that were, were used um, by the artists as like a poster publicity for um, you know documentation of, of their of their work so and then some are just kind of straight behind the scenes which are kind of for the personal archive of, of the artists or artists so um, this is quite recent actually these these few images that are coming out from David Roberts Art Foundation which is um, a kind of installation and performance space um, by and the same Clark. I don't know, it's still on that at the moment actually, it's running until the 2nd of May I think. So this is the opening night, sorry that's not part of it. Um, <laughs> um, and so there were lots of performances going on on the opening night um, in different spaces throughout it. I don't know if you know it, it's quite a long kind of um, flowing space. So there's um, 
lots of things going on, quite narrow spaces to get through. So some of the issues are, are very practical around actually navigating around the audience and, and the performers themselves, and obviously without disturbing it too much, and things like that, which is, um, can be quite, well, I, you know, because as, as a documentarian, you don't want to ever impinge upon the performance or kind of spoil it either for the audience or for the artists, you know, you don't want to irate artists. So communicating beforehand is kind of crucial and, and key and, and kind of touches upon what Alex was saying about collaborating. So working with artists is actually quite a, a good process to, to kind of perhaps maybe attend a rehearsal or, or something. It's quite good so you kind of know what to expect and what to happen, what's going to happen basically. So you know where to be, you kind of talk through the practicalities of, you know, what what is a good overarching image of, of the you know getting a whole scene in that kind of encompasses or encapsulates the whole work kind of in, in one image I guess but also working through details and kind of close up shots as well so um, because I, I think I, don't know, I kind of enjoy the argument of just actually experiencing a performance itself and and not documenting you know from not being a photographer's point of view but actually experiencing something is is, is great and everything and. Uh, mm. Uh, but um, I think that a photograph can also offer, um, you know, aside from the experience, um, a way for an artist to reflect upon their work. You know, years down the line, you know, you might only ever do one performance. You know, some, you know, and you've got to get it right. There's a huge pressure on me taking the pictures, and you know, I don't screw it up. And so working closely with someone is really, really important and really, really crucial. Um, you know, besides all the other practical things, hammering out kind of, you know, lighting, is it inside, is it outside, is it a moving performance, you know, does the actual setting and staging of a performance change, like Camden Art Centre, this was walking through outside, inside, so I had this problem of getting in front of the audience but not being in the performance, running ahead while things are coming towards me, it's all these different kind of concerns and problems that um, can arise um, during these events, um, but ultimately it's, it's, it's really satisfying trying to kind of because I've got, I've got the kind of trying to document for the artist's personal archive, as I said, and then there's also the publicity for the, you know, maybe the institution that represents that artist, or, or you know, trying to think about, um, yeah, I guess kind of piquing people's interest without giving too much away. That's the kind of benefit I think of stills. And I don't do film or quick disclaimer. I don't ever video or do uh, film performances. That's a whole another skill that is it's great, but it's it's not what I do. But um, I think the power of the image is it's a mental one as well, you know, there's things that can kind of stick in your mind and kind of suggest things many, many years later. So, um, yeah, and I think also the, the collaboration <laughs> with our best audience, yeah, art audience watching the boxing match, it was a restaging of a, a boxing match in a, in Swiss church, just off Shaftesbury Avenue by artist Laura Eldred, who I've worked with on like four different performances or something. So. She also did the, the Swanage, uh, kind of two columns that you see, that, that is another work of hers. So um, she likes having that relationship with me because we worked on, you know, across, she trusts me, I guess. Um, she invites me to the rehearsal, we can discuss like, all different, different kinds of things and doing portraits for the performers. She collaborates with um, non-professional performers or you know, groups who are local to wherever she's working. So yeah, it's, it's really just all about communicating and uh, I guess, being just clear about what, what what's expected of you. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Yeah, I think that's mostly it, really. I don't want to walk on too much. That's perfect. Yeah, yeah. just so great. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So some of the gallery works I make are designed to be running for the hours that the gallery is open, um, with visitors uh, walking by, seeing other works as well. Uh, and I also make these works which are, you know, might be a one-hour piece in a proscenium art, arch theatre with a, an audience sitting in rows from the beginning to the end. So, uh, and also all of the work that I'm making is in different ways discussing relationships with uh, spectators or the nature of exchange uh, in the live event. Um, and so these, these different conditions and the, the subjects of the works themselves raise a whole range of um, challenges and possibilities for documentation. Um, but it, it feels important to acknowledge at the start as well also that the, um, and it, it touches partly on what Alex was talking about, the possibilities that documentation brings, um, the certain potentials that um, documentation brings for extending the thinking that's already at work in the pieces themselves. Um, so, so I'd, you know, we could we could generalise by saying there's this uh, kind of two two approaches or two two basic kinds of documentation. There's lots in between, but there's two basic kinds. And perhaps the first kind uh, is is more perhaps what Tina was talking about, which is the documentation that you're creating with an aim to finding a future for your work. Uh, a, a really practical purpose. Um, so documentation that you're likely to send to curators or programmers or to introduce people to your work, um, either that specific piece or your practice in general. And that's probably going to be documentation that in some way accurately captures uh, particular appearances of the work or aspects of spectator experience or contextual conditions. Um, which might be the sort of more, I, I, I think perhaps the sort of uh, photography and film documentation comes, comes to, is often associated with the word, um, with the word documentation. But that there's, there's, uh, there's another approach as well, that, um, that the second sort of basic approach to documentation might be uh, that which takes a different form, but somehow touches the essence or expresses the essence of your practice. So it could be, I mean, this isn't uh, thinking of documentation as more performative, um, performative rather than representational. So it could be that when I, when I consider what's at work in my practice and the kind of thinking that it's doing, that I might decide that producing a zine is the most, is the most appropriate way to sort of extend the ideas of work. But of course, that's not, that's not going to be very useful for Tina if she's thinking about whether she wants to put my work in her space because she doesn't know what it looks like from, from a zine that's, um, that's more conceptual. So, so sort of offering those as the two sort of uh, basic differing approaches um, to what documentation can be. And thinking of the latter, the, the, the sort of zine idea is um, as, as more generational, as in it's generative. Um, and actually, you know, I'm going to mention um, Alex, when he was talking, spoke about a project he had done back in 2007, and, and I think that's the first time we met, yeah. was at that time, and I just, I loved this project that Alex was doing, which was the writing project he mentioned, mm -hmm. and it was, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm going to describe it from yeah, my memory, which was that he would um, go to see a show, and he would sit, he would take his seat, in the in the audience and he would turn to the person next to him who would be a stranger and he would have a conversation with them and he would ask them what had brought i think you started by asking what brought them there that night and it was then, about expectation it was a conversation right, about expectation right, yeah what they expect of the show and then so then what existed afterwards was a transcription of this brief conversation with a stranger who happened to be in the audience of the event so as documentation what you don't have is a response to the event because it hasn't happened yet, because all these conversations occurred at the start. But, but as an example of documentation as a, a, a more generative possibility, I think this is a really um, lovely example of, 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 of rethinking or thinking uh, in other ways how we can how we can work with it. 
And, and I also thought I would drop in, just for another sort of, sort of specific reference, um, a, another, another relationship to documentation being one of resisting it, but not from the perspective of uh, performance, uh, uh, you know, only exists in the moment. It's sort of, uh, it, it's only performance because it, because it becomes performance because it disappears. Um, but I wanted to mention Tino Segal's practice of uh, not recording um, images or, 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 or resisting any kind of material um, detritus at all from, uh, from his working processes as an extension of his artistic practice of dematerialization within art galleries. So not only does he not allow film and photography, he doesn't sign contracts with galleries, he has them notarized, they're only spoken contracts. So this is because he's trying to, you know, it's part of his critique of the object becoming commodity within, within the, um, the contemporary museum. Um, so another example of a relationship to documentation extending the thinking of that work in, in the art itself. Um, but I'll move, I'll move on to um, talking a bit, talking a bit about my my practice and my relationship with documentation. And I, I guess, I guess I, I, the, the main thing to say is I haven't resolved my relationship with documentation. Is I'm aware of these possibilities and I'm aware of uh, the two sort of uh, uh, um, basic stances I've just spoken about, and I document my work or I have my work documented. But I'm not. Um, I haven't figured this out yet. Um, so I, doc I document my work through photography and film, usually. I also write. I do academic writing around my work, but I'll, I'll leave that aside for now. Um, and I'm going to. I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm going to show some video documentation this evening, which I, I kind of chose because I knew there was a, a photographer on the panel, so for the sake of variety. Um, but also, um, I, have, I work with a, a videographer called Susanna Dietz, and, um, and I, we have a really great relationship. And so, I mean, this has come up in, uh, Alex was talking about this, Dan was talking about this, having a strong relationship. Um, with uh, people documenting your work is, um, is a really essential thing, I think. And by a good relationship, I mean, you know, we've done several jobs together now. We talk a lot. Susanna comes into my projects as early as possible. So initial, you know, even in the, the, at the point of initial conception before practical work has begun, often I'm in conversation with her just to let her know how things are developing. Um, Often, though, budgets determine the, um, the level of, of exchange we can have. If I'm on a limited budget, then we just we can't indulge in all of that. Um, we discuss the nature of the work, and we talk about the practical possibilities. But very basically, that's what we cover um, as preparation for, um, for, for her coming in to, to do the recording she does. And we, and we have a history of questions, we have a shared language, uh, she's familiar with my approaches, I'm familiar with hers, and we've done, we've done some experiments together as well. Um, so we have these really useful shared references. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to show excerpts of um, short showreels or trailers that I asked Susanna to make, and they're of pieces that were very different in their nature. Um, so for each, I asked Susanna to create a trailer of around five minutes. So I was really prescriptive about the form, but that's because that's the kind of thing that I get asked for. I know that's what I will need. Um, and I'll, so I'll talk about them one by one. So can we, can we go to practice first? It's um, a performance of one hour, and it is uh, it's a very uh, it's a very slow work initially. Might 
entirely predicated on the fact that one of those performers is performing for them. Um, it's, it's absolutely about the dynamic of exchange. Um, and it, it's, we, you know, I think, I, think there's, I think this is great, this trailer. It's um, a very, very challenging work, though. And there were lots of things we wanted to experiment with in developing this, but didn't get a chance. So maybe, yes, I think we can play it now. So again, one of, one of our strategies was to film it, to, sh to show the trailer right from the start. So this is the first spectator coming in and the first performer. And based, so basically, this lady, Kalila, swinging her arms, is going to perform as long as this spectator is watching. When the spectator leaves, she will leave. This guy walked in, and the, the second performer, CC, began. So it was trying to capture that relationship, um, and then moving into a shot where you might see um, more performers. So at all times, the number of spectators has to uh, correspond. It's, it's, yeah, it's absolutely equal all the time. So then we have shots like this, right? You know, you have the back of someone's head right in the foreground. And I think, I think the part of this moment. Oh, no, it's a different section. So again, obviously, moving between shots where we have, we have some of the spectators in there, Trying always to have moments where we can see the um, the mechanism. What's the audience? Sorry, oh, that's on purpose. No, it's not on purpose. It shouldn't be stuck. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's the audience told not to cross the line with that? Go automatically. So it was. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. Too, it wasn't too strict. I mean, we we say you're yeah. you know you're invited to be in this area in that one. Um, it was usually actually it was. Um, you know, lots of lots of toddlers would run into the middle of the um, performing area. Uh, <laughs> so one thing when I was researching this piece, one thing I tried was um, I got a I got a pinhole camera and I got one of the performers to wear a pinhole camera, so we might have footage. From, from inside the performer experience, we might have footage then of the spectators watching. Um, and this was an interesting idea. Uh, I think this must be the moment I was thinking of before. You just saw those two heads cross the screen and then those two performers leave, so you get the uh, sense of that relationship. So the idea of the pinhole camera to, get, to record the, the audience presence, um, it didn't quite work because I could just, I just got the cheapest camera I could, and we just didn't have the, the, the money to explore that more. The other idea we were interested in with this piece was to have a, a fixed camera um, on, this, on the ceiling so that you might, you know, you could see this equivalence of numbers. I mean, the, the, the very different forms that the, the different groups would be making. But again, we, we, we face certain restrictions. We would have liked more cameras as well. Um, but uh, this is this is where we got to with this piece, and then if we can if we can move on to the final one. So this final work is called um, Do Re Mi, and this was um, uh, you can you can encounter a reconstruction of this piece in uh, mm -hmm. in Block Universe, which was mentioned by Louise and Finn. A very a very it's going to be a very different version of this piece, but this work was. Um, do re mi was uh, mm. <laughs> you you might have um, the password. Again. The password is do re mi. D o r e m e. It's not different. Me. Um, so this piece was shown as part of a group show called Mirror City at the Haywood Gallery, um, which was on from October through to January, um, and it was part of a group of um, a, a group called Volumes Project, which was a group of choreographic works. Um, and all of our works moved through the gallery. Um, they weren't presented as performances. It wasn't something with a beginning or end. It was just uh, works that uh, were, were present amongst other works. They just happened to move through. 
Um, and so again, duration here was, was probably the biggest challenge because this work would be present for between three and six hours in a day. Um, and it's constantly conversing with the static artworks which are part of the exhibition. Um, but another really important thing to capture and which comes, comes up a bit later is the, the, the kind of casual disregard actually that um, uh, uh, certain visitors express, they, you know, that typical sort of gallery wandering. Um, there's a great image coming up of someone standing right in front of it just texting on their phone. And you know, and there's you know, this big massive thing sort of open towards them. Um, which maybe we won't be able to encounter. Again, this shift between the distant perspective and the detail, which felt even more important in the gallery, as, as spectators could stand directly over this work. So the way the way we so I had done Susanna knew this work um, and we did a site visit at the gallery and we decided I, I explained to her the route that they took because the performers would take a particular route. We discussed where different sites where she might place the camera, um, whether we should include the, the shots with the lift at the beginning and which happened again at the end and we did choose to include them. Um, and we spoke about getting a range of shots uh, that, that would include spectators in the background and that would include these sort of overhead shots. Yeah. Um, you said that it wasn't sort of presented as a performance, the audience didn't, mm -hmm. they didn't know they were going to see a performance, is that? Well, right? it was, it's more that, so one thing we were um, interested in this project was a certain concern that live work often appears as supplement to other um, forms in art galleries, specifically. And so we were interested in ways in which um, uh, the, the choreographic works we were presenting wouldn't, wouldn't take on that status. And one way to do it was we, they were all works that um, uh, constantly moved through, that didn't need to be seen from, from the beginning. And we tried, we didn't quite have enough money to be present the entire time the gallery was open, but we, we presented work for six hours a day. Did the um, presence of someone there filming it then alter the, the nature of the, of the sort of, because then having someone there documenting the performance was changing the nature of the performance? Oh, I mean, yeah, then. of course. Course, yeah. So whenever, the, whenever the, docu the documenting became part of the performance as well. Yes, so definitely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, always, whenever, whenever a, a filmmaker or photographer is present, you know, even I mean, Dan spoke before about trying to be subtle, but I mean, even being subtle doesn't. I mean, I've spent so much time in uh, performances, particularly live art performances, which which might be one-off events, yeah. and they are defined by the presence of photographers. Um, and the sound of picking and um, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I, something that comes to mind is that there was a big, big event um, called Visions of Excess years ago, which was a big um, overnight uh, um, uh, night in, in the in the tunnels at London Bridge, and there were a huge number of um, uh, live artists. In fact, I think Ron Athey did the work yeah, that did. you yeah, um, documented. Did that, yeah. Um, but it was, I mean, the entire thing was people with cameras, the entire thing, because it was such a, it was such a unique and one-off event, mm -hmm. but it became completely defined by, by the presence of cameras, which were, which were regulated. So always, of course, yeah. yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an uncomfortable thing. It's a really uncomfortable thing, because I'm, I do this, I set this up with documenting, for my work to have a future, and it's so important that the audience are in the documentation, um, particularly for these these last two works. 
Um, so but it's not it, the ideal is not for the is for the documenters not to be exposed. Yeah. 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 So you're saying this was somehow staged, but this doesn't happen at eleven. If you just go there as a performer, as an audience. Um, so you're saying like what you spent right now was more of a staged thing? This, yeah, this, previous, this was this the one. Hayward Gallery, yeah. Oh, this was at the Hayward Gallery? Yes. It's yeah, not yeah. Love. No, Love was the first, Love was the first one. Okay. Um, so you staged it basically, right, at the Hayward Gallery? Or it, was, was it was showing as part, it was shown for three months as part of a, it, it was on as part of the free exhibition there. Yeah. Right. Yeah.
decipher or help their audience decipher what is what. So what is the format? What is the medium that you're talking about? <laughs> Other than using installation or something. Well, I so, because one of the images, it could have been a photograph or it could have been a projection. I didn't know. Yeah, no, there was a screenshot. But I oh. think the thing with video is it's, it's quite easy now. If, it, if the work is video, you, you know, you don't want to then just put video online because that totally, that's the work, you know, you have to protect yeah. it. And also you kind of need to be in control of how it's seen. But then, so, so often with video, we're, we do a series of stills. So it's photographs and you just kind of see the difference in the video. Um, Good quality photographs help with texture when you're looking because you want to actually see beyond the image. You actually want to see the materiality of it. So, so that's where um, good, good photography comes from. Mm. Um, and then, then we, well, we use audio recording quite a bit, but that's always for our performance based work. Um, and I have to say that's by far the hardest. Like recording live is really. That's where we, we always come across problems there. Something, something generally goes wrong that we haven't thought about. You know, so, so actually install, when you're doing an installation and recording that, you've got a lot more options to keep coming back and trying to get it. And that, yeah, maybe just like even an important point I thought as well was when you were saying about how, I mean, you photographed it, the artist photographed it, or you know, then you have a professional photographer coming in and actually you know, I was curious to hear it that you really saw the difference as well in that and maybe the value of having something documented properly. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it, it brought so much because we, we started off with no funding, then we got some funding. And then you can actually, I hadn't really anticipated what difference the funding would make, but actually, you know, uh, from having good photographs, we had suddenly had Charles Saatchi in the space looking at the work, and you know, that hadn't happened to us before. And he literally, was a response to the photographs. It was, it was that, it was that straightforward. I, I think I should just clarify also, because yeah, I completely agree how important it is to, to kind of work with a professional phot photographer. And indeed, I actually do a lot of documentary photography similar to D David, Dan, 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 Dan. Dan. <laughs> sorry. Um, and, um, and, I, and so I absolutely value that. I think. I think, again, it's just about making those choices and being really clear about it. Um, and, um, you know, because I was sort of speaking about the presence of the kind of iPhone and stuff, and of course, I mean, you can actually get really good photographs. Yeah. In fact, Apple are running an advertising campaign. I don't know if people have seen yes. all about how good the photographs are on an iPhone. Yeah. Um, but actually, I think you'll find if you try to take a photograph in like bad light, like in a room like this, on your iPhone, it'll come out a bit grainy. But I think it's just about um, yeah, it's that, that there is there is a difference to be made, and also another thing to say is that sometimes a record, in a more kind of traditional way, is absolutely is absolutely like vital. And you know, just to emphasize from the point of view of me and from the agency, but you know, we're not we're not reporting we have to sort of try all sorts of conceptual and experimental methods. Um, it's just that you might do that as well as record it in a more archival way. Yeah, how does the, the, you just showed us sort of fantastic documentation, um, uh, I guess some recent projects. Has the way you documented your work evolved over the years and changed? Yes. Well, yeah, what, what has changed? Um, I mean, lots of little, little lessons that I learned. So I mentioned before about audience response. Um, one a, a previous piece I had done in a theatre, I only filmed, I only had the, um, the dress run film, the tech run film, so because we wanted to use several cameras and, uh, and then of course there was no, the, the piece, the piece happened to generate quite a bit of laughter at different points and it was, it was completely dead on the documentary and, and it was, um, also because it wasn't, you know, these weren't obvious gags 
It was something that really built up in the moment of performance. So watching the documentation, you might not anticipate that an audience were really laughing out loud at those particular points. So that was a massive lesson learned. And it's a, it's a film I just don't like using for that reason. It feels misrepresentative, importantly. It feels misrepresentative for that reason. That's why, you know, this is live work. It's about, it's about the other people who are in the, the room as much as the, the thing being looked at. Um, I think the thing that has changed is I just I plan it in much more carefully and I and budget as well um, because my my experience with um, uh, uh, not having a proper camera or uh, things things like not you know yeah I got a great picture but it's it's low resolution so actually we couldn't create postcard out of it and I mean they're very these are very obvious things. Um, uh, it's also really great when someone who knows what they're doing is taking care of it. And uh, if, if it, you know, if we're talking about this more more traditional archival um, documentation, um, but 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 also maybe just the level of conversation. Any 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 photographer I work with, any filmmaker I work with, we just spend we spend time together um, as much as possible because uh, because what they what they bring. Um, because it's a com it is a conversation. The work you make together is a conversation, right? I mean, it's, uh, um, it sounds like it's become part of your planning process, and it is an essential part of your process as any other part of the stage. Kind of, it's become something that you yeah. think about. It's not. Yeah. And um, there's one thing to, that just come to mind, and this is absolutely not the case in Nicholas' work, but sometimes you, you can get really good documentation of a really bad piece of work, yeah. Yeah. particularly with <laughs> photographs, because um, in a photograph, of course, something can look remarkably visual, and, there, and in fact, at the agency, like we've got most of our documentation is actually video. We do have an image ar archive, um, but we don't actually work with that all that much, because so often... Um, in, and we've got many photographs by many um, professional photographers, but um, like that's much more stuff that tends to be used for publicity and marketing purposes. Um, and so there's there's a kind of interesting negotiation there between the the, the kind of bad performance, good documentation. And I I, I have to say, I do you see that quite yeah, a lot? I, yeah, I wonder because it's kind of like at the proliferation of images through smartphones and how we're all on Instagram and all that. Whether that is actually um, encouraging work which is more visually appealing, work which is summed yeah. up in a photograph which can then be shared yeah. and that currency um, that, that goes with that, um, just in terms of, I, I make um, largely drawing installations, there's also a performative as aspect to that mm -hmm. and I struggle with documenting the fine lines and the intricacies of what is a very large piece, mm -hmm. capturing the, the, the enormity of it and the detail, it's something I've got to work out and you know, sort out myself, but it, I do wonder in a world where we share images and you know, we look at so we're bombarded by so many images so quickly. Um, that's, I mean, the, the other thing we've, we've talked mainly about photographs, video, writing mm -hmm. that's what we've really talked about, but there's also like the web and mm -hmm. there's possibilities to do kind of extraordinary interactive types of things, um, working with developers or if you have those sorts of skills yourself, there are actually relatively simple things that you can do. A very basic example would be like having an image that through a web page you can really zoom into. Um, that I don't know if people are familiar with the Google Art Project, which is a sort of online kind of gallery and museum. And they basically created a technology that was really about painting, about being able to zoom in in phenomenal detail to the Mona Lisa or to a Monet. And um, now for performance, that's kind of useless. <laughs> but for painting, their argument is that you actually get a better experience of the painting than you do if you go into the Louvre and see yeah. it. Because you can get to it, you can literally see the cracks in the paint. So, you know, like, there are constantly new forms being created for, for documentation to be actually interacted with. And that's kind of quite exciting. Question: How important is it to um, capture the audience experience of the performance itself, or what might the issues be in that? 
Um, for, for, yeah. for me, for me, for my work, it's very important because, I mean, for example, with the work assembly, mm -hmm. where where there was a performer per spectator, it, it, that was a very particular relationship, and it it the fa it forms the foundation of the experience of the work. So again, it would feel, I'll use this word again, it would feel misrepresentative to not include mm -hmm. that audience relationship. But I mean, it completely depends on the nature of the work, and it does raise these issues that I think you brought up of, of, of sort of intruding and, and co-defining the nature of the event if if a camera is is present in an obvious way. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, does the audience have to be informed about that? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Usually, yes. Yeah. But I mean, that's covered if you put a sign outside. <laughs> <laughs> but things like consent are important. <coughs> I've, I've been in this situation before oh, with the creative documentation of an event at the agency, and somebody actually <coughs> emailed me up more than one occasion saying, Sorry, I asked that question, can you not use that part? And of course, that's sort of, you know, that, that, that means I can't, can't use that whole thing. And so it's. You know, consent is an important thing. I actually have a, a story from another perspective in relation to consent, which was um, doing a work once that involved um, involved uh, non-professional performers. Um, uh, can, can I tell this story? Yes, and there was, a, well, and there was a, a, vul a vulnerable person who could not have their image anywhere. Um, and... Uh, again, having being in a position of, of having filmed the work, it was possible. It was impossible. I mean, also, in t you know, we edited we edited our documentation so that this person did not appear. Um, but it made it made a tricky task far more complex, far more difficult because if that person at any stage came into shot, we we just couldn't use it. Um, and so, so these other kinds of uh, unexpected issues come up as well. So consent on the part of spectators, but also depending on the nature of the project, um, on the part of uh, the performers as well. And then practically, there's lots of information about getting consent online, how to do that, the types of release form and all that. Because mm -hmm. um, sometimes people just get people a bit freaked out about that, but there's lots of info online about that. Well, that's actually, I'm just thinking, people who came in late won't know that this is being recorded. Are we live on an internet website? <laughs> Whoops. Uh, it is really important. I should have told people that that is actually mistaken. Is anyone so, else watching, Raina? I don't know. Oh, you don't. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, people could say stuff. I did say, I did always give out a this institution. Yeah. I now apologise. I completely forgot myself that we were being <laughs> So thank you, UAL. I really support you and you support me. Um, so any other questions or is it because it's great to have these people here and you won't again, it won't happen again. Um, but I have asked people to stick around a little bit. There might be like one bottle of wine and one bottle of beer left. <laughs> um, any more questions? Has anyone seen the pink book? We haven't seen it. It's given book. out. Like, oh, yes, things are circulating. That's I think that is that not on the table. Also, well, in, terms of of rapper, but in terms of circulation, over here are some uh, um, booklets about the agency over the last 15 years, and some sort of other leaflets and some bookmarks. Please help yourself to those. Mm. And you know what, I'm going to point out the fact that there's some people who we work with who make Arts London here. And also, to, um, I'll say thank yous to people, that's what I'll do. Um, so thanks to Camilla, who we've been working with for a long time, for coming and helping promote. And, um, and Meta is also here as well, but I don't know if she knows she, that she's been recorded, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, thanks to Nalida <laughs> for helping out. And I'm going to do my um, the proper thank yous now to Students' Union. Um, which is basically represented by me at the moment here um, for this talk. Um, Made notes one, which I've mentioned a few times, and, and will continue to do so. Um, <laughs> UAL, UAL Commonplace, which is um, a really nice little platform, actually, that UAL uh, put out there a couple of years ago, and it was for students to upload their own, generate their own content about their life at UAL. And that's, um, you know, that's still going, gets less attention, but hopefully it'll get more. 
and the more involvement they have with the student union. Um, we have Arts Council funding, so thanks very much Arts Council is absolutely brilliant. There's always a badge of, of kind of respectability as well as the actual money in my mind anyway. Um, thanks to Campbell for letting us have the space. Thanks to Rainer, this is tomorrow, for helping us record. And um, as Tina said, there's a whole conversation about the fact that this is a series of talks and we're trying to record them and realising the importance of recording the talks as well. 18,000 students at UAL, um, 18 if, if we're lucky here in these talks. Um, and uh, I obviously am going to thank the speakers. Um, <laughs> so uh, thanks, Louise, very much. So it's Louise O'Kelly, Buck Universe, and Alex Eisenberg, who was recommended by Arts Admin, I would say, who helped as well. Um, Nicola Conaberry, who you'll be able to see in the RA on the 14th of June. Um, Tina Spear, oh, no show space, no show space in um, Bethlehem Green, in a beautiful little street called Gibraltar Walk, which is gorgeous. Get down there, and now it has a sign at the door, so you can't miss it. Um, and Dan, um, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it, Boyle? Boyle. Yeah. So Dan will. Yeah. Um, and Dan will be amazing to have as your photographer by what I thought you might see. So mm -hmm. I don't know whether you have the money to pay for it. Exactly, yeah. So thanks, thanks very much, everybody. And stick around for whatever um, booze is left and whatever questions you have. And um, this is Nilly. Did, yeah, just speak. Tell me. Oh, it's feedback forms. Thank you so much. Yes, we need feedback. So if you could fill in the um, feedback form on the table over there, please. Thank you very, very much. That's really important to us. Um, thank you.